Hi, thank you. Good morning, everybody. Um, uh, Becky gave me a very broad brief on what to talk about today. <laughs> So this is what you've got. Um, now, I thought today we were going to hear lots about data and motivations and philosophies about EDI and why it's a good thing. And I think that's been beautifully set up this morning with the opening talks. I'm going to tell you a bit about the reality of trying to implement changes and um, basically cause um, good trouble. Um, so let's take it, you know, and I think storytelling is important to kind of stay to a root. So I'm going to talk about something that, you know, it's going to be a story. It's about some things that have happened to me because I think when we're talking about EDI, one thing is I'm a geologist, I'm not an EDI practitioner. And I think all of us in the room, or the majority of us in the room are not EDI practitioners, yet we're asked to step into this space and talk knowledge about this thing and change things. And we're not actually trained formally to do that. So it's something we're often doing under duress. Let's be honest, we'd rather not have things like this, quite frankly. We'd rather have equitable systems and frameworks already in place such that we don't have to try and dismantle them. So I'm going to talk about geology. What do geologists do? They walk around in the field with hammers, they hit rocks, and, and that's basically what we do, right? And, and that's very much the kind of uh, stereotypical view of, of what geoscientists do. It's very wedded to this idea of working in the field. And when we think about risks in the field, when we think about geological risks, we think about the terrain, right? So this is near where I live in the, in the Peak District. Um, we think about hills, valleys, water bodies. We think about things that can harm us and our students when we go out in the field because we learn a lot of our geological skills in the field. But often we don't think so much about are other kind of risks that are in the field, okay, and other barriers to participation. So think about intersectionality. There are other risks to other colleagues and students which are not so apparent, such as gender and sexual identity and the way in which that is viewed in different nations in the world and how that can pose a barrier to participation for people. We often don't think about those as readily as we do about uh, rivers or students falling down slopes and things, but they are, they are as, they are as, they are as, they are as apparent. So I'm going to tell you a story about that. A few years ago, Imperial College, 2020, you can see there, they put out this statement in a, web, in a press release saying that they were cancelling this uh, trip, field trip to Amman, the MSc programme, to be more inclusive. And it was consistent with their Stonewall Chartership, and it was compatible with their commitment to EDI. I'm going to tell you a little bit about what happened in the months leading up to that press release. So at the end of the year before, end of de uh, December, um, it became, you know, we, we had our Stonewall Diversity Champion Charter mem membership renewed. And I, it triggered in my mind that we were kind of planning to go to Oman, which is one of the countries in which um, certain groups are criminalised and there's a risk of imprisonment. And I said, you know, a quick question, um, should we be going to Oman because of, you know, laws have gone homosexuality? And is it, you know, that's my naivety. There are other, um, there are other um, gender and sexual identities which are also criminalised in certain parts of the world. In my mind, I just wrote, I'm just showing you direct quotes that I'm not trying to cover up my own naivety here. It's just been on mine. I sent that to the course director. And a, a week or so later, we'll continue to run the field trip because the benefits of a world-class geological education that takes the Middle Eastern culture far outweigh the potential negatives. So long as we are able to risk and manage the risks to students and staff. So that's a direct quote coming back to me in response to me raising an issue about some EDI non-compliant behaviour I thought was occurring within the university. I then spoke to somebody very senior in the university who was a bit more understanding and said, well, we shouldn't put people at risk, especially when it's a compulsory part of the examination requirement. So it's not something you can opt in or out. It was actually to get the march you need to go on this trip. And we should not force staff or students into a situation where they have to declare their sexuality or any other axis of their personality for, for that matter, quite frankly. And again, there's naivety in that statement. But still, there was an awareness from somebody senior who was identifying the fact that, you know, we were putting people in a position that was undesirable. And we should review going there. That was from somebody senior. So kind of a few months later, after Christmas, the decision was made to make the field trip optional, yeah. which is... <laughs> there was an alternative <laughs> learning experience for the I am a Derbyshire boy born and bred. <laughs> Right, so there was a suggestion made to me. Well, let's run an alternative field trip for all the quiz, and let's send us. No, and I, I'm using the language which was used to me. 
let's let's send let's see if they want to go somewhere else which is not oman but it's just in the rain soaked midlands of the uk and so they said also that another way they're going to mitigate these problems is by having a risk assessment that allowed uh, which briefed the students on what how they should conduct themselves in oman and they went end of february the field trip went okay and they went and there was a briefing the briefing was made like you know remove same-sex literature from your kindles make sure you remove facebook from your phones there was a number of things put in place that apparently made this issue go away and remained completely consistent with stonewall chartership apparently so they went on a great time looking at rocks months later with me still in a varying degrees of rage um it was um pride month uh, and it, and it came back to me again and a, a good friend of mine ben Britton, who I'll, i should comment on was very supportive through all of this um you know we kind of said you know we need to go back and, and look at, at this because it's going to happen again next year um, so again, they looked at making the trip optional, developing these alternative learning experiences and, and so on and so forth. And then, you know, at the end of the week, that press release came out. We had to push and push and push incredibly hard through all of this. Now, the reason I'm bringing this up is because there's a lot of force that's required. There is, you know, I'm here talking to you today, but actually there was about half a dozen people who gave me the, the, the chops to kind of take on you know, not only the direct field trip leadership, but also the college more generally. You know, I announced on Twitter and I kind of talked a bit about it. And, you know, in the end, somebody sent an email to me, a colleague saying this. And this is from a colleague who is a professor. So I think we were just talking over coffee and tea outside about the fact that academics are clever people. Um, and super smart, but their assessment of the decision to remove this field trip that it was a political decision and that we were just being what is now in modern parlance known as woke. Um, so it's really disappointing that through all of that, we kind of got to where we needed to be in terms of our activism, but were the learnings, were learnings made by people? Did we change minds and cultures? And I think that's one of the things with Ignite and that's been referred to here. One is the, the, the processes you put in place to allow you to achieve some target, and that could be something like um, a quota. But the other thing is more systemic and systematic changes to behavior that required, not just the framework within which we're operating. What was curious as well is that there was a lot of pushback externally as well. There's just a couple of replies there saying that we were canceling this field trip for no reason. It's a loss regardless of reasons. Yeah, you know, the, the, the more utilitarian bit of me was like, well, we can just go to somewhere where it's safer to look at the same rocks. <laughs> you know, I was just like, it's just not that. It's like, this is the least hard problem to solve in 2020. It was, it was my, it was my, and you know, there was a lot going on in 2020, right? I just thought this was like, yeah, you know, I thought this was a really easy thing to do. And it, and it turns out that it sort of wasn't people thought. <clears throat> Just another kind of, you know, another kind of example of when EDI activism, if you will, goes bad. I'm standing here in front of you working with the Jacobs rather than the University of Manchester, and I'm no longer an academic, right? But that all came to pass last year. Um, and that's, you know, again, when we have these issues that occur where in this particular case, I've tried deliberately here not to talk directly about, you know, being a black geoscientist, but I'm, you know, so I talked about uh, a group of people who, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm the cishet man, right? But here I just want to reflect on myself a bit here, where when, you know, raising issues to do with racial discrimination, racially inappropriate or insensitive language, um, you, you, you raise it, there's a number of processes that I can put in place to tackle this. And I think your chancellor who was here earlier on himself said this, right? He said, often we have reporting frameworks and we have ways of doing things, but they're poorly implemented, if at all, right? So I, I thought that was one of the most self-aware things I've ever heard a chancellor say, you know, that reflection. The reason I raise this is because in the investigation into my complaints, I'm gonna show you a number of quotes which were made about me and that incident by people in the cold light of day, months after the incident itself but during the investigation. So my comments about racism were unhelpful and resulted in people feeling unhappy. And this came out of the BBC News article about the proportion of black professors. It was the BBC article that was written by 
and Palav Gosh. So my appearance in that BBC article where I didn't name the University of Manchester, by the way, or Imperial, I, they, uh, they were unhelpful. There was already an acceptance that there is a potential for racism <laughs> in Manchester. Now, now, bearing in mind they'd had a 92-page manifesto that had been published by the University of Manchester in the wake of the murder of George Floyd around tackling systemic racism in the institution. So they were, you know, it wasn't that there was a potential racism the university had rightly and, and admirably held their hands up and said, what do we do about this? Labeling the university is institutionally racist, which didn't happen, was detrimental to attracting staff and students from diverse backgrounds. <laughs> so, you know, I, I, I laugh a bit and you're laughing, but what's kind of troubling statements like that is that the bad actors are the ones who are raising the issues. And I think for the people who are engaging in these networks, one thing about EDI activism, you bring some money in, but it's not going to make you popular with certain groups of people. And I think preparing your your spirit for that is important. And stating that the institution was racist would attract much media attention, and so it did. So what's next? You know, let's end positively. You know, there are a number of networks in Jacobs where we're trying to bring people together. Harambe is one of those, and there's a number of different academic and non-academic groups, which again are kind of trading on this deficit model, right? A lot of these groups are all advocating and upskilling those people in those underrepresented groups, powering them up. And, and that's not what we, we really need. I'm incredibly hostile to that approach. I'll be brutally honest with you. I think we need to do much more to agitate and remove the barriers and actually to dismantle frameworks. It's harder personally and in terms of your, your kind of emotional state, but if the, those of you who are willing to do that, I really deeply encourage you to do so. We need corporate change, PwC recently, you know, like, are we willing to really take a, rip, a hard look at ourselves? And I'm glad to see, I think, Tanvir and yourself looking at publication metrics. Oh, um, Anna Cora was going to look at that. And I think one thing when we're trying to dismantle these frameworks, senior people are chipping away at their own pedestals. Right? Yeah. It's, a, it's, it's a morally very hard thing to do, because what you're doing is saying, I got here, but I didn't get here on this meritocratic joyride that I thought it was. And, you know, and PwC here are saying, well, actually, you know, by having this barrier in place, we're actually missing talented people. So there's a, there's a business driver in their case, as well as hopefully a moral imperative, but. And, you know, one thing I was really impressed with was Jeremy Farrar before he left, went to the World Health Organization when he was at Welcome, he was very um, much at the forefront of their efforts around anti-racism. And, you know, they put in place a bunch of stuff in 2020 and they basically failed. And Jeremy held his hands up and said this, um, as, as, as written here, you know, it was very clear that they'd not done enough. You know, they'd not done enough to get to where they needed to be. And again, I think that's one thing we all need to do is have that degree of introspection, both individually, but also as institutions and say, what have we done to uphold these systems and discriminate against certain groups of people? And it's really not very nice, is it, to kind of to do it? but. You know, I think it's the only way we're really going to get to where we need to be is to have that that self awareness at institutional level and as individuals. So, uh, thank you very much, and I look forward to the panel.